Guys, thank you for uh, coming through. As you know, we are going to be uh, uh, doing an interview with uh, uh, Jim DeRogatis and Greg Cott of Sound Opinions fame. Uh, we have, uh, you know, put their Twitter over here on the page, their Patreon. You can check out their website as well. Look that up. And uh, as usual, during our interviews around the halfway point, which I'm, I'm sure they're cool with, uh, we'll be taking some fan and viewer questions. So make sure to scroll down a little bit and hit the tab that says Q&A. You can submit your questions there. Uh, the mods, Swar and McFarline will get those questions to me. And uh, we will feed them to our guests later in the show. Um, uh, also, you know, as usual, be respectful and kind to our guests in the chat or you get booted, booted immediately without question, without question. And um, uh, we can handle you, ourselves. You, you, yeah, you, <laughs> I'm from Jersey, you know, originally. It's like, uh, don't worry about it. OK, so so that so that so they're asking for it. They're asking for it. whatever whatever you give them in chat. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay so be nice for all music lovers look what i love about what you've done on youtube is uh, you've created a passionate forum for geeking out about music you love you know and in that fundamental way uh you know you are absolutely the same as me and greg or any you know uh, uh, that new york times article about you a couple of months ago you know the professional rock critics you know fuck professional my thank friend. you thank you, you know what makes somebody a critic? Somebody is a critic if they have uh, an emotional reaction to and an analysis of a piece of art and they can back it up. Not just Foo Fighters suck, but Foo Fighters suck because A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, G, right? Um, you know, the pizza at this place sucks. Okay, why? If you can back that up, you are a critic. You are every bit the critic that Robert Christie. Well, I, uh, well, that's what the show's about. Everybody's a critic. That's what gonna, we say. I was going to ask you guys it. later if you thought I could take on Robert Christie. Um, you, you, you think sure. I could take the guy? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you have a thesaurus. Pro probably not but, a thesaurus, um, no. But what is admirable about Bob, even in his dotage, is uh, how much music mm. he listens to. He's a voracious mm. listener. You know, it's just he kind of sometimes takes the joy out of it. You know, I'm more from, as you know, the Bangsian mm -hmm. school, uh, where it's about let it lurk. You know, if you're excited about something, shout about it, which you do your fair amount of. <laughs> I try to. I try to. Well, I, look, as as you guys have already seen here, look, you know, I'm, I'm ashamed to say and I'm unhappy to say that when I, I originally announced this interview, um, there were a lot of responses that were like, who's that? I don't know who the hell that is. Why are you talking to these people? And I, I do have to say, like, right off the bat, when I first started my radio show um, in uh, Hartford, at WNPR, and the Needle Drop originally began as a radio show, Sound Opinions, uh, Jim and Greg, were a show that I listened to. Uh, quite often. And, and when I started my show, I wasn't really like aware of what they were doing. And, um, you know, it almost became like a bit of a, 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 you know, an illustrative moment where, you know, I was almost like being shown the way a little bit, you know, it was kind of like a combination of uh, following different music blogs online, seeing what you guys were doing, also taking, you know, in a lot of what YouTube vloggers were doing at the time as well, and sort of being slightly inspired by that. And all of that coming together into, you know, the, the uh, amalgamation, the brand that I guess, you know, it's, it's kind of like built into today. And, you know, the more kind of thoughtful and critical and, you know, just like strictly musical side, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, certainly seeing what you guys were doing was a, uh, um, you know, inspiring that side of, of uh, what I was working on. But uh, uh, in, in order to get to the point that you guys were then, I knew I still had sort of like credibility and, and stuff to like build up. And I had to figure out a way to do that. And kind of going to YouTube, I thought was like, you know, the obvious answer at that point, because uh, trying to pitch the ideas that I had to the people at the public radio, you know, local company that I was uh, working for, they just like weren't open to any of it. And around that time also, which which I'm sure you guys uh, remember this, like late 2000s, it, it's, it's better now, but like late 2000s public radio audience was like absolutely like not open to a lot of hip hop, not open to a lot of yeah. metal music. I mean, I would repeatedly get um, 
little features in the song of the day column on the NPR site. And if ever I, you know, uh, had uh, the the editor sort of allow me to, you know, write up a hip hop song, the comments would immediately be like, this isn't music. Why would you waste time posting about this? This isn't real, this. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Yeah. And, you know, it's... Yeah. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. It absolutely is. But, you know, it, it's we've just always been too stubborn to not take uh, uh, no for an answer. <laughs> you know, it's like we both came from the fanzine mm. world, which instantly dates us you know uh eight and a half by 11 diy uh mimeographed xeroxed fanzines right today you just start a blog um and it was you you write not expecting to get paid not expecting to create a brand but because you can't imagine not doing it you're passionate about this music you could just as well uh imagine not eating or breathing and we always say and the crucible test of this came this year in the summer uh, that, uh, you know, if we were fired from our jobs tomorrow, we would uh, go work at Kinko's if we had to or Starbucks and continue doing this out of love. And when, you know, we parted ways with the radio station, uh, the public radio station that had given us a launch pad 15 years ago, and suddenly we found ourselves uh, with no income from doing this and uh, you know, 150 stations that still wanted to air us and really good download numbers. So do we give up? Well, fuck no. You know, so we, <laughs> the two of us haven't been paid since August, but, you know, we have two producers who work with us who are incredibly talented. Uh, I know you're very close to your uh, producers helping you. You know, I mean, we get to do the fun part, me and Greg and you. We get to talk about what we're excited about. And then well, the producers have to edit it and put it together. And Anthony, what you were saying really strikes home with me because with us because the whole thing about we got that same kind of resistance about why are you talking about metal or why are you talking about hip hop uh, almost from the out of, out of the gate and first of all you know as music journalists for newspapers you know I was at the Tribune Jim at the Sun Times we were writing about everything uh, because that was a job you had sort of a general audience that you were writing for and also I also thought that the people who were programming radio were kind of myopic in the sense that they were kind of reflecting what their taste what their taste was and going why would anybody be interested in that and i go you know we're interested in all of it genuinely we're not doing it to sort of like pay homage to an, a genre that nobody cares about i don't know about you i'm i'm i'm, I'm convinced i'm sure that you like are like us and all your uh, most of your listeners are that way they listen to a whole different a lot of different kinds of music all the time and they're interested in all of it to, to sort of like completely you know block out entire categories of music because you don't think somebody's interested that that's crazy and we've always operated on that principle if we are moved by it we fi figure a lot of our audience is going to be interested in it as well and one of the joys of the job as you probably know too is just being able to introduce uh some of your listeners who may particularly like a certain kind of music but you introduce them to a record from a different genre and they go, wait a minute, I, I think I, I could kind of like that. And, you know, it's kind of opening up a world in, in, in a lot of ways. So we've always. You know what? If you didn't like it, there's going to be another uh, needle drop tomorrow. Another <laughs> sound opinions next week. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I, I do try to uh, create that kind of experience, but, uh, it, you know, I, I try to contribute to that in my own way. But simultaneously, it sort of seems like there's this larger, I guess, bend on the Internet toward. I, I can't quite tell. Are things becoming more varied? Are listeners becoming more adventurous? Or are, you know, sounds and what's popular becoming more homogenous? Because it's 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 a little weird to track. Because simultaneously, um, I remember a time when I was younger when I was listening to a lot of different genres of music, but most people who I knew really just kind of specialized in or focused on one or two things. You know, you had guys who were just strictly into hip hop, guys who were just strictly into indie or metal or, you know, people who are just into pop music. And these days I'm running into people repeatedly online and I see like things like their last FM accounts or their Spotify accounts where they're kind of compiling all the stuff they listen to throughout the year um, where they're just listening to stuff uh, from across the board. They're listening to some black metal record from some random person and they're enjoying the new Lady Gaga record just as much. Um, yeah. And, 
you know, while that's happening simultaneously, it's, a, you know, when I'm looking at the charts, I just hear one record after another that, you know, almost like sounds the same or has a lot of the same production tactics employed. And it seems like there's less variety in some spaces, but then there's more variety than ever in other spaces. And while that's happening, I see this new generation of artists coming up who don't really seem to think anything of like, oh, yeah, we're going to do a trip hop song. We're going to do like a sunshine pop song on the record and we're going to do like a shoegaze type song and we're gonna do like a neo psych song that sounds kind of like tame impala and we're just gonna be all over the fucking place and the fans love it you know and and because uh maybe that doesn't seem like a big thing to them because that's like how they're digesting music through these playlists where it's just nothing but you know random tracks that they love that are just kind of going all over the place you know part of it is uh anthony the more things change the more they Mm. stay the same if you ever go back and look at uh am radio pop hits uh for top 40 playlists from the mid 70s they're all over the map you know you got old billy joe and then you got uh you know bay city rollers and then maybe a queen song and and you know uh top 40 radio is what was popular what people were enjoying and uh, not all of it is good but goddamn abba sure holds up as you know the best stuff ever right you know and then everything got sliced and diced and narrow cast and formats. And it's about the companies creating marketing niches to sell to people. And I think go back to my Gen X roots, go read Naomi Klein's no logos, right? When any genuine form of youthful cultural rebellion can instantly be co-opted as a marketing pose, what is the last frontier uh, to assert your individuality to fight the man? It is against all marketing. So people are, are paying no attention anymore. I'm surprised to hear you even say the word chart. I haven't looked at a billboard chart in 15 years, 10 years at least. Uh, I used to have to for the job, right? But I really don't care. Awards don't matter. Radio play doesn't matter. What's on MTV these days? Nothing but teen pregnancies, right? I mean, you know, um, none of that matters. What matters is what you're listening to. And you turn me on to it. And I turn my friends on to it. Word of mouth is always mm. the most. And I think I think this the, your average Spotify by playlist is reflecting that. Um, you know, I, I think uh, people who may be unfamiliar with you guys are seeing why I'm having you on now, because both between both of you, it's, you know, decades of music journalism experience. And, you know, I know that over the 10 plus years that I've been doing this, I've experienced a lot and I've seen a lot change, but going even further back and watching that change happen from an either like an even higher, you know, vantage point, what, what do you guys generally say, especially considering what you just said about, you know, word of mouth kind of being so significant and kind of being supreme? Um, you know, what do you feel generally about the way that social media and the Internet has been able to democratize, you know, the uh, the music opinion market, as it were, and and really kind of like level the playing field in terms of like fans, musicians, music writers and publications and who's whose takes right, and points of view uh, were like really matters. I, I think it's awesome. And I, I think it uh, I've learned a lot from the democracy of criticism if you you know using that phrase i mean uh, a lot of people out there are listening and i think it, it's great that we have these forums now to share uh information about stuff um i think there can be never enough ears out there uh appreciating good music because there's so much of it now more more human beings are creating more music than ever in the history of humankind so by extension, there are, are is more music being made, and there's more ways to get that music out in, into the world. And one of the things that has changed most significantly in the way I approach the job of being a music appreciator, a music critic, is that uh, I always felt for well, not, not always, but initially, that I could get my wrap my arms around what's out there. Like I had a sense of what was out there. Uh, now I feel more and more. Like there's so much coming out that I can't mm-hmm. keep up. And that's becoming an increasingly bigger problem every year. I'm constantly discovering new things all the time from an incredible number of sources. I mean, you think about it, how narrow that pipeline was uh, 30 years ago for getting music out into the world. I mean, there was tons of music that was being made that had no way to be exposed. No way. You wouldn't know about it. Now, it's just like the floodgates are open and it's great that there are more people listening to it. 
And you know what? People are just more sophisticated, I think, in the way they're they're accessing music. It used to be the field of experts, you know, right? People sort of saying, oh, this is good and this isn't. I'm glad that's gone away. I'm glad there's more voices out there. It's made me better at my job. And see, yeah. we never we never had that attitude. We may seem awfully old compared, although I know, Mr. Mellon, you are older than you look because your name, your age was in the New York Times. Um, we may well, seem how, old. How, how old do I look to you? I, uh, I think you look, you're 36, right? <laughs> that's how old I am, I'm 35. <laughs> I know, I know, what I'm, I'm kidding, I'm making a joke. I don't even know what my joke was. It used to be we were snotty uh, 18, 19, 20 year olds who were daring to say that the most important album this year, in my case, was Husker Du's Zen Arcade, not this fucking board in the USA, Bruce Springsteen abortion, you know, or in Cott's case, the Minutemen. You got to listen to the Minutemen and the hell with fill in the blank, right? Meatloaf, Bat Out of Hell too. I will defend Bat Out of Hell 1. But, <laughs> um, you know, and we didn't know what we were talking about and we were on the outside, right? I mean, we were always on the outside. I think the outside is the only place to do great criticism from. So we never worried about what the charts were or the industry were. We always consider ourselves democratic. When I was, uh, you know, uh, 18 or 19, I was writing for a fanzine called Matter Magazine. And it was run by a young woman who went to Northwestern University uh, Journalism School, Liz Phillip. And uh, her star writer was one Steve Albini. And the way they handled important records was they would have a main review, you know, replacements, let it be. Greg Cott would write 500 words. And then five or six other critics on her staff would each write a 250 word review. And, you know, Albini would think replacements sucked. And I would think, you know, this is great. This is the you know second coming of the small faces or the Rolling Stones. And Liz would write with her little writ lisp, uh, you, know, you know, Paul Westerberg is so dreamy when he sings unsatisfied, my heart melts. And in this dialogue of five or six old school, pasted up, printed magazine uh, forum, you got a real sense of the discussion that we were having at Maxwell's or CBGB or whatever club. And I, I think that that democratic conversation between people who care has always been criticism at its best. And, and the new technology, you're right, the you know ubiquity of these little things in our pockets has made that even broader. We can now have that conversation with New Zealand and Taiwan and, uh, you know, Hoboken. Um, just to remind everybody on Twitch right now, if you guys scroll down, you hit the Q&A tab, you can submit questions for our guests, Jim and Greg of Sound Opinions, uh, that we will be asking later in the show. Um, to move on from there, it's, it's uh, exciting, but also in a way disappointing or disheartening to see music journalism in a state where you have this incredible wealth of diverse opinions, like coming at you in every direction from any number of voices. It seems like more people than ever are doing it, but simultaneously the more traditional signifiers and business models of the health of the industry, as it were, are either being bought out by large media publishers that are just kind of like treating it like a billboard to play, you know, to paste like advertisements on or, you know, uh, certain blogs and websites that have been going for five, six, seven, ten years straight are closing or looking into crowdfunding options like it's it's I, I don't know whether or not to be excited or worry at this point, like that things are going in a positive direction. But how can it move in a positive direction if people who are doing it so well can't find a way to support themselves in the process? That's I, I think that's the key issue uh, in in art and culture in the 21st century. Uh, I wrote a book uh, called Ripped about 10 years ago. I was so excited about uh, the digital revolution, right? This was going to democratize everything, level the playing field. The promise of that was so, so enormous of what it could mean in terms of the way music was distributed and the way it was being accessed. And that was obviously going to affect every form of intellectual property, you know, right, you know, movies, um, the written word, et cetera. I thought it was a good thing. Uh, 10 years later, I'm not so sure. I think what we saw was the uh, you know, the undercutting of all these major corporations that were dominating basically the way music was being distributed and accessed. You know, you had the radio conglomerates, you had, you know, a half dozen multinational uh, labels, uh, and that was it. You know, the indie, there, was, there was indie labels, obviously, but they didn't have nearly the clout or the power. 
then the idea of a, an internet, like, wow, threw that all out the window, you know, under, undercut all that sort of leverage and cut out the middlemen, you know, artists could reach listeners directly. But what's happening now is meet the new boss, the same as the old boss. You know, you've got Apple and Spotify and Google are the new Sony and Warner Brothers and, you know, um, and, and BMG. And suddenly it's the names are are different, but the uh, the centralization of power in a handful of multinationals is really, uh, once again, uh, the, the big issue. I, I think I think music's in a better place now, frankly, than it was 25 years ago in terms of just the way people can access it and the way pe- people can talk about it and the way people can distribute it. But I'm, I'm really concerned about the fact that the the Internet uh, in some ways is is once again, uh, just like the old nas- uh, music industry is becoming a, uh, you know, the power is held in a handful of multinationals. And that's a bad trend. And I think that's going to be the real dilemma about how we approach the next uh, 10, 20 years. And and I tell you, Anthony, um, what we do talking passionately about records we love or that disappointed us, um, you know, I don't think the universe is going to be hurt if we can't make a living doing that, if we have to go out and get a real day job and then do this for fun on the side. But in our years at the Daily Newspaper, I mean, if I did not have the backing of the Chicago Sun-Times, R. Kelly would not be sitting in jail in the Federal Detention Center downtown Chicago looking at a life in prison for destroying so many lives for 30 years. The reporting that Greg and I did, uh, this is the non-glamorous stuff, right, about Live Nation gobbling up the concert industry from coast to coast, the many local uh, challenges shutting down live music venues and national challenges. I mean, they're in an existential crisis right now. Without the uh, protections that are coming, the extra money bailout that's coming to them now, thanks to the Biden administration, uh, the Save Our Stages Act, they were not going to reopen. You know, nine out of 10 venues were not going to reopen. Where were we going to go see these bands? You know, the emo band, the death metal band, the rapper, uh, you know, that is only on SoundCloud, right? You know, um, there are some existential stories and and criticism is free. We can sit and listen and formulate our opinions and have this discussion on YouTube or on our podcast. That's great. But it takes money to do serious reporting, to expose companies and corrupt practices like Lollapalooza, like Live Nation, or even worse, like R. Kelly. Why did it take so long for that Evan Rachel Wood story to surface on Marilyn Manson? I wrote about his his treatment of, of female fans 12 years ago. You know, I mean, and that's tough work. And that you need to be paid for even if you're paid poorly you need to have the lawyers and the editors and the fact checkers and the institution behind you yeah i mean it i feel like it's absolutely humble of you to say what you said in terms of a you know the world not shedding a tear if you weren't making bank off of doing sound opinions but i do think it is worth noting because look i mean in my position i run into a lot of people from a lot of different platforms that you know run pretty healthy brands whether that be on twitter or facebook or instagram or tiktok and you know whether through in person or online we exchange and i'm like you have millions of followers or millions of views or interactions with everything that you're doing on this platform like and and they find ways to get by but you know i'm i'm like instagram doesn't pay you no tiktok doesn't pay you no. Twitter doesn't right. pay you? No. You know, Facebook doesn't pay you anything? No. Well, you're driving millions of hits to their website every day with everything that you're doing. Right. How are you giving all of this free labor for nothing? You know, I mean, that was yeah. that was yeah. part of the reason I went into doing what I was doing, you know, what I'm doing currently, because back when I was in public radio and they said, no, we can't pay you to do what you're doing, you know, while it was nice to sort of have the clout for the moment that I did to sort of, you know, get my foot in the door with certain PR people and be like, Hey, can I get like a promo for the new vampire weekend or something? Um, uh, you know, but, but eventually I had to move on because, you know, you have to sort of make an adult yeah, decision. You built yeah. Something. yeah. You know, you built something. And the, 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 what Greg was saying is the way the digital revolution changed things is it's easier than ever to start 
your Rolling Stone to start your pitchfork. And then, you know, I hope, Anthony, you do not eventually sell out to the HBO or the whatever. I mean, I wish you the the the, the wealth that such a thing would bring. But, you know, I mean, look at Pitchfork. From starting in a kid's basement in Minneapolis, right, in a mom's basement, Ryan Schreiber, you know, and now owned and brought to you by Condé Nast. You know, I mean, this thing that was a labor of love that became a sustainable business for a good dozen people is now part of the corporate global cool. hegemony. You know, as I, now maybe Greg and I are full of shit. Maybe we have never sold out because no, nobody's ever asked. <laughs> it's possible, you know. But uh, I don't think constitutionally we'd look, be capable. And tell you the truth, I don't think you look, are. I, I mean, I love doing what I'm doing and being in full control of it. Uh, there was an opportunity for someone to buy what I was doing early on and have me do it for them. And I said no, because I wanted to keep it. But, yeah. you know, look, if, if Apple gives me $75 million to sit on a fluffy white couch to across from Kendrick Lamar and ask him some softball questions... I look, I not only will it not you're saying you, you would you would be Joe Rogan. Not, if not given only the would it be hard to say no, but I may just send each of you guys a million bucks because, you know, if I ever take it, if I ever take it, I'm, I'm just underwriting sound opinions from here until eternity. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. I'll say that. Um, wow. I got that. I it's got on that tape. tape it's really. on tape. Um, yeah. Write that down. <laughs> All right. Let me uh, uh, ask one more question along more business lines before we get into maybe some fun ones, because there are a lot of people who watch who are aspiring reviewers, reviewing themselves. They're starting social media accounts. They're doing music reviews on YouTube, on Twitch, on Instagram, wherever. Um, you know, as of right now in this very volatile state, what's like the most simple, straightforward baseline piece of advice you feel like you could lend to anybody starting out, you know, right now who wants to get their voice out there and some opinions out there on records they're passionate about? You do it and you don't stop doing it. You don't give up. You want to be a writer, you write, 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 and then you write some more. You want to be a podcaster, you want to be a YouTube person, you just start doing it and you don't take no for an answer. You realize that at first you will suck right and you will continue and you will suck a little little less each time you know nick tosh has put it this way in pioneer of the early days of rock criticism you, you you can't be afraid to make a mess on the page and if you stick with it and if you have the passion if you're in for the right reasons um you know you're gonna get better and then that, that those three followers are gonna lead to 300 leads to 3,000. That's my take, right, Greg? I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, do this um, opining about music unless you were completely passionate about it, loving it, just just the thought of doing it. You can't imagine a day without it. Um, for me, it was, you know, writing was a huge motivation. And then when I discovered music, like the world opened up for me about what how incredible music was. And then reading a few key writers about how you could write about music in this way that was just beyond my understanding at the time, but really fascinated me. That really, that that just was the driving engine for me. I, I had to do this and I never turned away from it. It was like, I, and as Jim said, you know, I found myself writing something every day because I wanted to, not because it was a chore, but because I was excited about a piece of music that I heard or I, I bought a record and I would review it just because, hey, somebody told me you could do that. And then somebody paid me for a review. I said, that's ridiculous. I can't believe that somebody would actually pay me to do this because I would probably be doing it anyway. I just like doing it. So yeah, that was kind know, of the driving force. Rather than talking about ourselves, Anthony, we should do two hours right now on what the weekend did, uh, you know, on the Super Bowl and Phoebe Bridgers. I was actually going to talk about All both these, those things after. <laughs> these freaking baby boomers upset that this young woman destroyed right. her guitar. We had her on the show. She's a brilliant artist. Who doesn't feel like breaking shit in 2021 while we're locked up in the pandemic? Thank God we survived Trump. But I want to—I I don't have a guitar. I want to break something. Like, I, I felt like breaking stuff in the reaction to her. You know, people. The reaction that she got made me. I was mostly stuff. shocked by people yeah. who were 10 years older than me and older looking at her as if she's the first person to ever break a guitar. Like, wh why would you break a guitar as if this isn't sort of like a time-honored tradition? 
you, you know what I the who you missed what you know. <laughs> but uh, you know what I loved about it is that she had a wicked smile on her face the whole time. I you know yeah. she was like enjoying herself. This yeah. this woman was enjoying her. The joy was evident to me. It was not like a here I here's my calculated move. It was like I'm really having fun with yeah. this, yeah. and I, I thought that was you just know, great. Like I, I don't know, I, I'm just shocked by the lack of appreciation because you know it's it's clear they went out of their way to make a thing of it because like the second time she hit the monitor, sparks came flying out. And look, I've <laughs> I've been at my I've been at my share of punk shows. I've seen guitars, microphones, drums. Yeah. Face like faces, beer, just I've, I've seen just about everything hit a monitor that you it doesn't spark, you know. So, so yeah, it's a special effect. So, so they went out of their way to create the special effect at the end of all of it. it at the end theater. of all, and it at the end theater. of all of it, like the reaction was like, really, during a pandemic, such bad taste. And it's like, wait a second, <laughs> like, how. But who did the same thing that the, the stage crew used to rig explosions in, in Moon's drums? Well, there you go. Over, you know? But but the thing is, like, you know, you're, you're making a big deal of saying that it's in bad taste that she broke the guitar during such what bad times or something as if, you know, bad things aren't happening during every decade, you know, of, of human history. But, you know, beyond that, yeah. it's like, uh, and, you know, and to hmm. be a woman who realizes that uh, Justice hmm. Kavanaugh sits on the bench the decisive vote uh, along with mm -hmm. comey bryant about what she can do with sure. her body perform in front of band clad in mm -hmm. skeletons right you know i mean i think there was a lot more like when Sinead ripped up the picture that of the too Pope after singing a song by bob marley the rastafarians believing that the catholic church condoned slavery which guess what historically mm -hmm. it did you know, like somehow all that got yeah. missed. Oh, no, a lot, a lot, a lot <laughs> well, of things it, get missed because it seems like there wasn't that much yeah. deep thought into it because how could you sit there offended that someone's doing something in bad taste, breaking guitar, breaking guitar during a pandemic, but yet you're watching a sketch show. You know, it's like, you know, how, how could you not just as easily fold your arms and be like, really making jokes right now? Like during You're not during a pandemic. And it's like, and simultaneously, what are you doing? You're yeah. dicking around on Twitter. You're dicking around on Twitter during a pandemic. Really? Is that what you're just going to dick but around on Twitter? Doesn't it warm the cockles of your heart to know that people can still get upset? Right. The music? I, it, it does warm my heart. It does and warm I, my I, heart. I, I, you know, I, 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 th I thought after Manson, it wasn't going to be shocking for anyone in any way, but I, I stand corrected. No. And, and the thing about her is that, you know, she won because she got all this, like people were arguing about her for sure. days now. And, you know, we had Phoebe on the show uh, a couple of years ago. She did a little, little live uh, set with us. And the one thing that I, you know, when you're around her a little bit is you kind of realize she's got a mischievous sense of humor. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, people say, oh, she's like Elliot Smith. She's this kind of morose, you know, potentially suicidal young woman. You know, she's singing about all these depressing things. And she's not like that at all. And I just love that to see that side of her on that show. I just thought it was a wonderful you know, way to present herself to the world, because I'm sure a lot of people who are watching the show had not heard of her yet. Uh, they certainly know her name now, no, I you know, uh, so mission success. All right. You know? um, let me throw a few fun ones at you guys. Uh, questions that sometimes people often ask me and I struggle for an answer to or I'm just annoyed by them. So I kind of want to annoy you guys about them now um, <laughs> or, you know, stuff that I'm just generally curious about because I don't often get to ask these questions to anybody else. Um, so, you know, being somebody who is critical and puts takes out there on a regular basis, uh, you know, what we say often has an ability to stay out there forever and, you know, you're forever accountable for everything that you've ever said. Uh, so having said that, uh, what review or take that you guys have given over the years still haunts you to this day? Doesn't necessarily need to be a review that you regret saying, but uh, it's still a review. It's a take that you're, for whatever reason, it just keeps coming back. It's always re rep, you know, representing itself uh, no matter how many years you continue to move on from it. <laughs> Boy, where do we start? Oh, just, right, just, it's the one, the one or two things. that stand out the most. I mean, I know for me, it's probably my beautiful dark twisted fantasy, but for you guys, it might be something different. You mean 
I guess you're saying is it something that we got wrong or we just kind of missed, it, it missed doesn't, the boat It doesn't need right to be something that. that you got wrong or even regret having said, but maybe people generally are unhappy with the fact that you've said it. And uh, for whatever reason, you know, it, it continues to define what you do. Uh, you know, I don't know how people were unhappy. I, I, I just think about the ones mm -hmm. that I missed. And I and I think in, in terms of just like being way off base or, you know, I, I um, I'm not, I'm I'm totally against hype but i think early on i i succumbed to that a few times you know like where i started to like you know i have seen the future of rock and roll and it is you know <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And it is and a cheap made, commercial by bruce springsteen yeah and i you know i said something like that about jesus jones once and um it was really kind of nah that didn't really that didn't really uh you know <laughs> historically that didn't hold up very well and and part two of that is the young one of the young people in that band who i did admire i liked the band uh showed up at my house uh a few years later uh they were an english band and this englishman living in in in, in chicago showed up in my house to uh you know do some work around the house and he reminded me of that review <laughs> and it was kind of like i'm sorry man <laughs> it's just like you know one of those things where you kind of like I kind of miss that one. And the curse, you know, talk about, they always say that rock critic endorsement is like the kiss of death for any artist. It's like, oh yeah, the critics really like him. You know, uh, that guy's not going to have any success at all. And I think the number of artists that I have championed that no one cares about, I, I think that's probably like, sometimes I question myself, like, what am I, am I just totally a self indulgent indulgent jerk don't answer that question anthony it's like you, <laughs> yeah, know, but I, it's yeah, rhetorical. I think, you know jesus jones had a couple of moments you know look, look lester bangs told me when i was 17 you know uh, i spent a day with him he was dead two weeks later he said never chris trust a critic who doesn't occasionally double back on himself right lester in one famous review said that exile on main street was the worst album ever made like four or 5,000 words in cream. And the next issue, four or 5,000 words, it was the very best album the Stones ever made, one of the greatest in rock history. I think we live with this music and it, its impact and its uh, power over us is changing all the time. And if it's not, you, you know, you're dead, right? I, I, my own greatest hits, I mean, tend to be really um, uh, illuminating in a litmus test sort of way. You know, the Ryan's a Adams voicemail or uh, my interview with that asshole in Third Eye Blind. Like 50% of the people read it and say, boy, Stephen Jenkins or Ryan Adams really made you look like the pompous douchebag you are, Jim Deerogatis. And 50% of them read it and say, you let that guy hang himself with his own rope. I can't believe the idiotic things he said. You know, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. You know, if you can simultaneously piss people off off and think and have other people think that was the greatest thing ever that's when you've done so no i i absolutely agree and you know to uh Greg's point earlier, I mean, there, there are a lot of reviews I'll put out where I'll have the same sensation where I'm just feeling like, who the hell am I even recommending this for? Although I, I will say in the internet age, it is a little like even slightly easier to kind of like track when things even in a small way do kind of catch on a little bit from having endorsed it as opposed to, you know, if something obscure only gets a very small cult following post, maybe a article or something, and you don't really, you know, you can't sort of like see it in real time happening online. But, you know, at, at least in the internet age, it's a little bit easier to track. But the, yeah, but you know, real time is so deceptive. No, it is because right? you, you don't know how long I mean, it's going to last. Know. Well, and, and if I, uh, you know, if we count the people who claim to have seen Neutral Milk Hotel <laughs> now, when Airplane Over the Sea came out, right? It, it, it's 100,000 people, you know? And Cotton and I were at those shows and there were 50 people and, and 30 of them left, you know? And, and I think certain things uh, take their time, whether it's the Velvet Underground or Neutral Milk Hotel or, you know, and, and, you know, just because you went out on a limb and said, this is great, or you went out on a limb and said, this is a hype, you know, and everybody thought you were wrong or ignored you in in 1990, in 2000, in 2010, nothing is sweeter in this business than sticking around and having the last laugh. Well, it, I mean, believe me, I have that long list of critics who thought, what are you being a pompous moralist douchebag for, Jim, picking on poor Robert Sylvester mm -hmm. Kelly? 
it's like, oh, I think I was right. <laughs> well, going to that a little bit, but speaking more in terms of like a review sense, um, I, I know, uh, you know, you were just talking about uh, Jesus Jones and sort of making a call on that and it not catching on. But like, you know, what would you say over the course of your review catalog has been like your best call in terms of like early on endorse this and you know, it ended up catching on or, you know, it, it, I ended up feeling like a moment of validation from having said, this is great. I knew it was great. And the fact that everyone has kind of taken to it kind of shows that. Well, I did. Um, and, you know, I don't particularly say that I, I made this band or it's not even close to that. But I, I do feel like I was on Nirvana early because my brother-in-law lives in Seattle and he was hyping me early on saying like, here's a band you really need to pay attention to. And this is like a couple of years before Nevermind came out. And then I remember when Nirvana would tour, I went to see them every opportunity I had. And they were usually an opening act for, you know, a, a bunch of shows that I sh saw them play in Chicago. And that's when I first met the band. And I would drag my friends out to see them. And I remember there was one time where they were opening for 11th Dream Day, which is one of my favorite bands back in the day. Uh, at Metro, which is a pretty big venue in Chicago. And 11th Dream Day was uh, some was pretty popular here. Um, and, uh, you know, Nirvana still didn't have any name recognition. I said, we've got to go see this opening act. And this was probably a year and a half before, again, Nevermind came out. And they were phenomenal. They, my, friend, my friends, we all stood up at the front of the stage because we could easily get up there. There was nobody in the venue yet. They were all going to show up later for 11th Dream Day. And the band just did gave this phenomenal performance. And speaking of Phoebe Bridger's breaking stuff, uh, Kurt Cobain broke everything on the stage that night. Um, I still have this memory of the bass drum rolling toward us as the show ended, you know, sitting there in the, you know, standing there in the front of the, of the stage and Cobain just completely trashing everything after the show. I, you know, the, the image I had was like, and it, you know, this rag doll being shaken around by this gigantic Rottweiler, just being, swung around the stage. I mean, it was almost like a superhuman performance in terms of just what his body, what he was putting his body through, the self-destructive act. So anyway, you know, and my friends still remind me of that to this day. So 12 people were think I'm really spot on, you know, in terms of getting, <laughs> no, you got getting the early right. jump on something. You got one thing right in 40 odd years. Right, exactly. You were right about that, Ben. <laughs> Pretty much it. I love transmissions from the satellite heart by the flaming lips. They were the best band in the world until they suck. <laughs> and now they've officially sucked uh, about a third as long as they were great, you know? So it's like, look, you know, the sad thing, Anthony, and I don't know you, if you've been at it long enough is that, uh, you know, when you're a journalist, when you're a critic, there are certain bands that you connect with. We, we, we live in this world and maybe you get to meet them and you genuinely like them. And I'm not saying that uh, compromises your objectivity. But when I teach uh, reviewing the arts at, at Columbia College here, you know, I, I tell my students, you, you have to be ready to uh, commit the ugly baby sin. Right. And what I mean is uh, some babies are just goddamn ugly. Right. They are just they look like drooling bulldogs. Right. But you go to Thanksgiving and you meet your cousin's new baby for the first time. You can't say, gee, cuz that is an ugly fucking baby. Right. The job of the critic, unfortunately, is to say the baby's ugly and you can't worry on occasion if the baby is. And most babies are. And they also fart and burp and spit up this white shit all over you. It's horrible. Right. When they you have to burp them. Oh, you know, they're a pain in the ass and they're ugly, you know, but you can't say that in polite society. The critic says that. And why do they say it? Not out of malice, right? Because when you were a civilian and not a reviewer and nobody cared if you ever got a free record, you know, if a friend said to you, you got to buy this record, really? I had my doubts. Oh, no, no, you got to run out and buy it right now. And you went out and bought it and you came home and realized it was a piece of shit. And you said to your friend, this was a piece of shit. I wasted my money. And they said, ha, ha, ha. I knew that would happen. What kind of an awful, masochistic, sadistic relationship is that? You're not going to lie to your best friend about about don't waste your time or absolutely dig into this. Do it right now. You know, it's got to come from that place and only that no, I, place. I, I agree. And it can feel like a like a really daunting task if you're in a position where maybe you've given art, given an artist like maybe two, three positive reviews in a row. Um you know, I, I guess I could say how I feel fortunate is that when I was starting, 
it was really just at the tail end of the artistic peak of like the indie wave that I was kind of covering at the time. So by the time, like a lot of those artists started putting out their, <laughs> their shittiest stuff, um, I didn't have a track record of like reviewing them four or five times beforehand. And then as I was sort of starting to build, you know, my own thing purely in sort of the online space and just the internet age, um, I, I guess the blessing in disguise of what, uh, Greg was talking about earlier in that there's just so much to talk about. There's so much to cover. There is so much that you need to keep track of that you can't keep track of all of it is that, you know, even if I do have to give an artist a negative review, there's so much to talk about outside of that, that it's like it's hard to even focus on that for too long. You know what I mean? Because immediately after having, you know, sort of personally been disappointed um, by a particular record that I was looking forward to, I have to move on to the next thing. And honestly, like over the 10 years that I've been doing this, there's some artists that I've reviewed four, five, six times. And, you know, sometimes that review has been a three, sometimes it's been a six, sometimes it's been an eight. And it doesn't necessarily follow a downward slope. Sometimes it's up, down, up, down, up. And, you know, honestly, like I feel like at this point, if you know, you understand that I'm doing this long term and you're doing this long term, then there's always, you know, another chance down the road for, you know, not just me, but anybody else to enjoy what it is, you know, you just did. And as you said, you're not the only voice mm -hmm. doing this. The two of us are not the only voice doing it. The more the merrier, bring it. Everybody should have a podcast. Everybody, everybody who's passionate and a good listener. Right. And if you're not, then don't don't waste. Our I, I, th I do think that is where we're headed, though, once everything becomes either automated or shipped to another country, like everybody's either just going to have a TikTok or a podcast. That's basically sort of the world that we're <laughs> heading toward right now. Um, so, you know, you, you talked about doubling back a little bit earlier. Um, and, you know, in reference to that, what would you say is like one of your hardest 180s that you've ever that you've ever done, like, you know, critically, be it from a hate position to a love position or vice versa? I completely missed, uh, I, I couldn't get into Radiohead mm -hmm. early on because Tom York's voice is was a huge impediment. And then one day I just learned to stop worrying and love the Tom, you know, and it's like, oh fuck, I was missing something here, right? And, and that is a difficult voice to love. I also think, um, you know, partly being a drummer, partly loving Nirvana, partly loving Grohl's drumming, I certainly like the first two Foo Fighters records. And now they've made one song from that record 10 more mm -hmm. times. And like, if I never hear another Foo Fighters song, you know, I think in retrospect, I was, but I don't know whether I was too kind to the first two records or they have just sucked so royally ever since that I'm so angry that I want to take it out on them going backwards. Also, you too. I mean, I really like, I, I thought the whole flag waving, save the world, you know, bullet the blue sky thing was a pose and a fraud. And then I really liked what they did with Brian Eno on Octoon Baby. And now it's, you know, Bono selling jeans with his wife's poem and sewed into the pocket and save in Africa and Live Nation 360 deals and, you know, $250 to see them in the nosebleed seats. And fuck you too. Just fuck you too. And the white horse Bono wrote so yeah i am sorry now i ever said anything good about them but i do love octoon baby well you know it, like i i feel like uh it's 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 hard to uh sort of balance cynicism because i i, I think being a little cynical especially in an age of like such uh aggressive marketing it, it's kind of important because then you just sort of like are potentially a fool for anything and everything. Um, but it can certainly, uh, uh, you know, prevent you from getting into things that maybe you should or appreciate them as much as you possibly could. I had a similar experience with, um, not really being that into Radiohead early on as sort of friends of mine were introducing them to me. And that was partially because by the time that I, you know, was being introduced to Radiohead, I was already into, you know, various waves of punk music from the 70s to the 80s, no wave, post rock, soft machine, da 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 da. So by the time that they were sort of presenting this to me, and, you know, and also being heavily into drum and bass as well and various shades of experimental hip hop, when they were being presented to me as like, oh man, this really experimental, mind blowing band. And I'm like, this this doesn't even yeah. sound vaguely experimental to me. Why is this? What, Apex tweeted like, it better. Like, yeah. why, why, why is any of this groundbreaking <laughs> to you? But 
then, you know, yeah. as I sort of, I think, grew into being a little bit more of a poptimist and came to sort of appreciate historically how they worked into the greater scheme of the mainstream, going back then and listening to their old stuff. And that was also around the time that um, In Rainbows came out, which I was impressed with on first listen. Um, then I was able to like, OK, so now I sort of see the appeal. And even though it is good and it's not as, you know, daring as some of the stuff I was listening to at that time, you know, it's, it's still like, you know, good stuff. Well, I think that word you used, optimism, I think that is the, the most silly debate in the history of mm. rock criticism. <laughs> o- open I mean? it up. Open uh, it up. You know, when Khalif Asena wrote a piece way, way a million years ago, 20 years ago, it was the first attack on rockist rock critics versus popist. And he was taking me on for, uh, you know, hating any band that didn't have guitar bass and drums and like i had written that week about aphex twin you know what i mean what are you talking about you know i think it was always code i think it resulted in a generation of critics round about your age but not always you uh not not hardly ever you um that decided that if something sold uh 20 million copies there must be something good about it and that is not always the case ABBA sold, you know, hundreds of millions of records. I think ABBA is great. You know, whether they are or not, I mean, my opinion is my opinion, your opinion is yours. There's no wrong or right in art, right? But it leads to this fallacy. It's the McDonald's thing, 80 billion served. Therefore, McDonald's must be the very best burger. Now, as a dedicated meatitarian, I know me some good cheeseburgers and McDonald ain't one. All right. You know, just because it sold 80 billion doesn't mean it's the best. And then you had a generation of critics who were genuinely afraid to criticize something that was selling. And, you know, whether it was Limp Biscuit or InSync or Britney Spears. Yeah. And I think that was the big issue is that optimism, that whole trend uh was in some ways a good corrective because i think a lot of criticism had become sort of a boys club with their with their pet project pet bands that they loved and supported and you know therefore taylor swift couldn't be any good uh you know it it, it's that kind of attitude and it, it was to me it was important to sort of understand that pop music not all of it's great but some of it is and i think a lot of times critics a lot of critics that uh, you know, including myself, probably uh, would shut that down just because, oh, you know, like, as Jim was saying, the McDonald's, you know, all these people love it. How can it be? How can it be good? And, you know, I, we'd have artist friends, people who would make music for a living who would sort of amplify that. Like, it, you know, wherever the crowd starts to form, I go the other way, that kind of thing. Well, no wonder you're still living with your mom. You know, it's gonna, it's that kind of thing. It, 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 it's It's kind of a I think it was important for critics to get over themselves and realize, you know, some of this stuff is really good and listen with, you know, what, you know, we keep telling ourselves we're ready for anything where our ears are wide open. Sometimes they're not, you know, you, you carry, a, you start accumulating baggage the longer you do this. And you got to sometimes discard some of that stuff in order to be a more, you know, uh, to, to have value to the people who, you know, listen or, or read you. Yeah. And, and personally, I feel like, um, it, I, I, I think taking these genres and these artists seriously in a critical sense can only help at the end of the day, it can only help either the people who are listening to this stuff be more critically, uh, you know, thinking about it or listening to it and can help the artists as well, yeah. because I've, you know, conversed with quite a few people who have mainstream careers who, they tell me they watch my reviews. They tell me they follow other reviews and they tell me they follow the things that other people say about what they do and they apply it and they apply it to what they're doing. And as a result, they work with a certain kind of producer. They go for a certain kind of sound or they take a certain kind of risk or they just try something different. And in some cases, it I think it works out for the best. Sure. Absolutely. I think it's good to have that dialogue, you know, that conversation with people you write about them having it with you, the fans, the, the listeners, the audience, whatever, being a part of that. I think that's 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 what it's all about. You know, it's opening up. I, I want to ask you guys a, a bit of an interesting uh, question about age. And we're, we're nearing almost the end of the interview here because uh, things are going so well. But, um, you know, I'm I'm getting to a point in my life where 
you know, I, I have a lot of friends of mine still from high school and college that I keep in loose contact with who, you know, they're aware of what I do, but, you know, they, they look at what I do from the outside and they're like, man, I, I used to follow you for such a long time and I don't even know who the fuck any of these artists are anymore. I don't know what the fuck any of this shit is. Like, I, I sort of remember Kendrick right. from when you reviewed him like years ago and stuff, but I don't know what the hell any of this is right now. Like, what, like, can you tell me any, like, at, at what age do you guys feel like people really start like, tuning out and do you eventually reach a point in your own life where you're like i'm following all this stuff i'm really passionate about it i'm listening to phoebe bridgers but i like i, I don't know anyone or i'm feeling like i'm just running into less people in my average everyday life who are, care about this stuff as much as me see this is a really unique challenge to the music critic because, uh, you know, Greg worked with Gene Siskel at the Tribune. I worked with Roger Ebert. You know, Roger, at the end of his life, uh, could no longer speak, could no longer eat solid food, uh, was confined to a wheelchair, and he was still reviewing four or five movies a week. And in the critics' uh, uh, screening room, where the 12 or 14 critics in Chicago would get to see the movie the week before it comes out so they could write their review, every time the lights went down, that motherfucker was like a 12-year-old kid getting to see his first Star Wars movie. It's a movie! I'm so excited, right? Restaurant critics don't say, I've eaten out of Vec or the French Laundry, therefore I never have to eat again, right? But pop music critics throughout history, you know, whether it was John Landau, manager of Bruce Springsteen, I've seen Rock and Roll Future, who quit famously 1972. It's never going to get better than the Beatles or whatever, right? It's never going to get better than Nirvana. It's never going to get better than the punk era. I was at a rave. I saw Daft Punk and Aphex Twin play in the mud in Hickston, Wisconsin. It's never going to get better than that, right? I don't know what it is about popular music that people just decide at some point my day was the best and I'm not going to listen anymore. You know, and I think uh, one of the advantages the two of us have, me and Greg, is I will call him on that and he will call me on that. And then that's the end. Right. You're a solo act, Anthony. I don't know who you got to keep you honest, brother. Maybe your wife. <laughs> but when you stop thinking that the best band you're ever going to hear in your life is right now rehearsing in a dingy basement in Pilsen. Right. Uh, then it's time to get out of the way. I mean, I, I think honestly, the, what keeps me sort of on track in a way is just the two way relationship that I try to maintain with my audience, because I, yeah, I try to yeah. project myself onto a lot of them. And, you know, while I don't just instantaneously lend credence to everything they tell me is good, because I think back to my own teen years and I think, OK, there's some stuff that I could look back to then, like, let's say Rage Against the Machine, Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. A lot of stuff from that day that I could look back on and say, like, you know, that was good. That was good. And there's some stuff from that point in time that I thought was good. Then when I became more discerning, I thought it was shit. And then later into my 30s, uh, you mentioned Third Eye Blind earlier. You know, that debut record, I, I still, you know, I, have, I there's a nostalgic place in my heart for that record. You know, I loved it when I was younger. Then when I went into college, I thought it was shit. I threw out the CD. And then, like, later into my 30s, I'm like, there's there's something about that. There's something about the, the I have been distressed to see the Third Eye Blind. <laughs> so, so anyway, there, yeah. there's that. But then there's also things I remember listening to when, you know, I was younger that I'm utterly fucking embarrassed about because like there's just so much shitty new metal i used to listen to like you know so many records like you know i i i used to have fond memories of you were talking about limb biscuit earlier like the like the debut and i i think i was like on a live chat with some fans during a live stream and i was like oh man you know you got you guys heard nookie and so on and so forth yeah you, you heard those tracks but like you got to hear three dollar bill there's some raw fucking stuff on that record and then i went and i hadn't heard it in years and then i went back and i played it I was like, the recording was so fucking bad. Like the performances were awful. I was like, how did anybody, how did this even get off the ground? <laughs> and everybody needs a stepping stone, it's, right, it's, Anthony? I mean, it's kind of like you have to get to the good stuff. It's some true. Way, it's true. And you're not going to start at the best right no, off the top. You know, I think everybody it's true. So, you know, the, the thing that I guess keeps me honest is that, you know, again, my audience, they're young, they're passionate, they love music to death. And, you know, whatever they throw at me, 
I don't have to say anything nice about it, but I'll I'll listen to it just as intently as I would anything else. You know, any, anything else that I'm just personally interested in on my own, because if they care about it so much that they're taking the time out of their day to get it in front of my face, because it would make their day to, for me to say that it's good, then, you know, it, it's at least worth like a few seconds or worth like some attention. If again, if sort of like they're collectively sure. doing it, sure. you know, and, and, and I and then you turn the mic on them, you know, you give me. Your emotional reaction, your analysis. Why are you so excited about mm -hmm. this record? You know, that's what we've spent our career. All right, I want to throw at least a, a couple of viewer questions at you guys before we head out. But before I do that, I wanted to ask, uh, just with the you know Siskel and Ebert reference earlier, um, and considering you know how much of a legendary duo they were in the realm of criticism, and how you guys have been you know sort of together for so long doing you do, uh, you know, to what do you feel like you owe your you know long term success as not just individual writers, but as you know sort of like a duo in this space as a as a collaborative uh, effort. I, I think uh, if you're talking about a specific person, I mean, there's so many, it's like, you know, inspirations. I mean, Siskel was obviously well, I, I, one I, of them. I mean, I mean in terms of like right. your dynamic working together is, you know, like what, what, do you, what do you guys feel like you add to each other as, as a, you know, together as opposed to separate? Well, I think the curiosity mm. is the key. We're constantly curious uh, about new music and about what's next you know as jim said my favorite record is the one i'm going to hear next week I, I, there's always that anticipation you know i heard that those two salt records last year and i was just blown away i was so glad to be alive a human being to be able to listen to those kind of records and now and say this is some of the greatest music i've ever heard you know the angelica garcia record last year i mean uh, that's the kind of stuff i live for and I think we both have that sort of attitude that we're constantly looking for this stuff that's going to fire us up and and make us really glad to be alive. You know, I don't want to live in the past. I don't want to keep listening to the same records I listened to in 19, you know, whatever, 1995 or 2003. I want to listen to this thing that's really getting me off this year. And, you know, we at the end of the year, each one of us makes a you know top 10 list and we throw, you know, trade numbers and say, here's what my number one record is, number three. Both of us are coming down on the side of these are the records we listen to the most this year. We just love these records. We can't get enough of them. You know, that's kind of the driving spirit behind the show. I think both of us have that. And we kind of inspire each other from a standpoint of like, look what I found. You know, it's like that's that's kind of the uh, I think the driving force of the show. Is, it has been that way for 20 years. Yeah, I think that's well said. I, I think also, Anthony, if you were to decide, you know, to go to the Siskel Ebert format, you know, uh, Jim Gregg format, uh, you would find that it's really hard to find uh, people who listen as hard as you do, with as broad a range as you have, you know, and uh, uh, when when Greg and I have ever thought about who else could we do this with? It's a very small list because the person who's going to have an opinion about the new Shame or Idols record, uh, an eloquent opinion, pro or con, doesn't matter, uh, and uh, you know, and the Mad Lib record, and can do a classic album dissection of uh, uh, you know Carol King's Tapestry, interviewing you know Carol if you're lucky, and Danny Korchmar and Russ Kunkel who played on the record. I mean, it's all of worth and also talk about you know the, the apex twin <laughs> why was richard d james a fucking genius right mm -hmm. i mean how many people do you know in our civilian you know music loving lives who could keep up with all of those conversations at once yeah it's it's you know, it's, it's, it's rare and it's tough and i i don't know what it is in a particular like even being someone who would love to to do that i, I don't know what it is in someone that they have it or they or that they don't that it they're able to do it i honestly don't really know oh I, you know look there, there's people i don't understand them i hate sports sure. right but there's people who give you every batting average going back you know i don't even know what a batting average <laughs> is okay there's people who have statistics in their heads you know and can talk about that shit our colleagues on serious beats who were covering the challenge that democracy faces covering the house and the senate and the trump years could tell you every member of congress and what district and the senators and what district and their staffs you know so part of it is we been journalists we we just know how to to do our research and we know what we don't know and we know where to go to find what we don't know so that we can not always seem 
stupid. I got an email that's been bothering me for the last 48 hours. I was talking about Angie by the Rolling Stones on a show. And you idiot, Keith Richards was only the co-writer. He didn't write 100%. You still, you quoted the lyrics wrong. And gee, that bugs me. It just, but I don't care if you think I'm an asshole for loving it or hating it, but the, that I got something wrong bugs me. And that's just old school journalism. Uh, you know, speaking of that, uh, this user, Real Cheese 225 uh, wants to know, um, do you find it hard to positively review music from genres you don't personally enjoy? I think this, uh, you know, sort of adds to the point that you just made where, you know, the, the art of journalism kind of requires you to, if you don't enjoy something or if you feel unfamiliar with something, you have to go out there and make yourself familiar with it. So, you know, what do you feel like is kind of the starting process of, of that action? You know, if, if you can't enjoy something because it's so alien to you, how do you go out there and learn about it and know it like the back of your hand so that you can criticize it? Edu educate yourself. Um, you know, earlier you'd asked like, what, what have you done a 180 on? And I would say something like country music, you know, like when I was a kid, I couldn't stand it. You know, I was a young critic. I couldn't stand it. Then I learned about it. I educated myself. I got, I got, I talked to some people who really knew their stuff and I did a 180 like, holy shit, there's some amazing music here that I have completely dismissed because I'm a biased, you know, jerk, you know, it's like, you open, you know, open your mind a little bit in terms of educating yourself. And I, I find I I don't think you could name a genre that I would say, oh, I just can't possibly, you know, entertain the thought that I would listen to a record in that genre. I, I, I'm, and I'm being dead serious about that. I think every genre of your music has probably had something truly cool about it. And it's my job to find out what that is. You know, it's like I, I if I don't know that, I need to find out that. And uh, it's been an ongoing mission. One of the things that is my great joy in, in, in being able to listen to music and talk about it and write about it is discovering that stuff, like finding out new things about, hey, there's a genre here I didn't even know existed. But now I'm now I'm like, like I'm going down that rabbit hole. I'm going to find out more about it. And I think that's that's the fun part of the job. You know, don't ever limit yourself in terms of what you can want to talk about. And if you are going into review predisposed to think I'm going to hate it, uh, probably don't do it. You're not doing anybody. You're not helping anybody doing it that way. You know, you can't be a food critic, food writer and say, I love I love, you know, I love all kinds of food except Asian. I don't eat any Asian food. I hate Asian food. This is like get out of the fucking way. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I trust me, brother. When the world reopens, we could take you to a polka lounge on the northwest side of Chicago to see three 85-year-old guys with accordions, right? And you're going to say, I don't like polka, right? And then you're going to walk out saying, I have seen God, right? <laughs> there is no genre that is utterly worthless. I do not want to listen 24-7 to K-pop, but I have heard some K-pop that is really fucking great, right? And I'm not going to become a convert. I'm not going to love it. But, you know, if you open your mind, you'll say, yeah, okay, all right. I can see why that has its legions of fans, and I like this part of it. And the rest of it. I'll yeah, you know, that, that's the thing. It's not even necessarily so much to teach yourself about something to force yourself to like it. It's teaching yourself about it okay. to understand what the appeal of it is. I mean, I know in my own experience, I've gotten emails and I've gotten comments for even just like even taking the time to even dare review a K-pop record. Now, like the review may have been like, eh, it's pretty decent. It's a six out of 10. You know, I'm not like raving about it or anything, but like even to take the time, even to like take it seriously, even to be like, well, I mean, it's produced kind of in the same fashion as a lot of Western pop music is. And you guys don't really seem to have a problem with how I review that from time to time. Why would K-pop be an issue? Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's not to have biases. There's no such thing as an objective mm -hmm. critic. You know, for years you get the hate mail that says you weren't an objective listener. No, fuck no. That's the last thing you want me to be. I'm 100% subjective. I cannot review a record from the point of view of Anthony. Anthony can't review it from Greg's point of view. All you can write about is how it moved you emotionally and what it said to you. You have to be honest, and, and that is your obligation to the listener, to the reader, to give them 100%. If the baby's ugly, you say the baby's ugly. And if you loved it, you have to say why. Yeah, and, and when I think about something like, when I, when I think about a purely objective review in theory, 
that to me sounds like the most boring review ever. Like it would be like, here's what the waveform looks like. This was the dynamic range. Here, 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 here was the chord progression of this song, and this is what the lyrics, you know, mean factually. You can't write objectively yeah. about. Not writing an encyclopedia. Well, yeah, entry, and, and, you know? and that's it's, that's the thing. Boring. The most objective review in my mind, conceptually, would just be like an encyclopedia entry, or like it would just basically read like liner yeah. notes or something. Which tells you nothing at the sure. end of the day, you know, uh, whereas uh, our, in, you know, every single one of us individually is a different person and we see the world differently. If you and me and Greg all decided to sit down and review whatever the new Foo Fighters, you said you're taping mm -hmm. that, right? Um, you know, uh, we are going to hear three different records because we are three different people. We have three different sets of experiences, three different contexts in which to hear the Foo Fighters, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's great. And it's in the conversation that the three of us will have um, that, 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 you know, the listener at home could get a better grip on will she love this Foo Fighters, hate this Foo Fighters, never cared about the Foo Fighters. Maybe she should. You know, it's all about the conversation. All right. Um, last question I'll throw at you guys uh, from McFarlane. He wants to know, uh, at, at what point in your own careers did you feel like you had almost made it in a way, uh, you know, reviewing and covering music. If, if, if that's even something that you feel at this point. I don't think I've ever gotten there. I'm 56. <laughs> you know, Grill Marcus and Robert Christgau both think I'm an asshole. I think that's a sign of making um, you know, it. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, these are people that I both admired and I tried to write fairly about them in the context of Lester Bang's life story. You know, we have never been part of the cool kids club. Um, we've never gone to gig once because we had the right name. You know, if Dan Quayle, kids, he was an idiot from Indiana who became vice president a long time ago. If he, he everything he said was always wrong. Um, but the one thing he said is that the media elite, you know, this idea of the media elite and Greg and I didn't go in Ivy league school. We never dated the right person. We never got the easy assignment from Rolling Stone or spin. Nothing ever came easily. I had to nearly kill myself for 20 years, you know, chasing R Kelly before anybody paid attention. You know, it's like, I don't think, yeah, I don't think we've ever been in the club. And as a result, for every young writer who ever came to us, every aspiring podcaster or broadcaster, you know, how do we get to be you? Where we're happy to talk to them and say, come watch us tape the show. Come to a show with me. Show me what you're doing. You know, it's all about pay it forward. Lester Banks took that time and took pity on fat young Jim Deerigatis at 17. Uh, you know, Gene Siskel gave Greg plenty of tips along the way. You know, it's like we want more people to do this. Welcome. If we can somehow help you because nobody ever made it easy for us, we're happy to do it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah totally 100%. And I mean, for me, it was never about the ambition was uh, I get to write about music. I mean, that to me was making it. It's like, I don't, I never saw this as a way to get rich or make money. I, it just, it was just not even, I didn't even think about that stuff. I just loved doing it. And somebody wanted to publish me, you know, there was this counterculture a zine where I was going to Marquette university that uh, wanted to publish me. And I just couldn't believe my luck. And then ditto for getting, you know, Back in the day when you used to get free records from record companies because, you know, they wanted you to review something. I just thought, like, who invented this? This is incredible. <laughs> I don't have to buy this record. I can. Somebody's giving it to me to listen to it. I thought that was just the greatest thing. I, I, I was I, I was happier than any day of my life when I discovered that you could actually do this. So that ever since then, it's been like, wow, I, I get to do this every day. You know, I wake up in the morning thinking, not bad. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Well, Jim and Greg, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk with me. And again, everybody who's watching, uh, you know, check out their uh, program, Sound Opinions, check out their website, check out their Twitter, check out their Patreon. Uh, you guys have just been great. Thank you for being a uh, good guests, open books, talkative, and uh, just wonderful vibe and energy. Well, it's an honor to uh, to be on your show, Anthony. You know, you are the it thing. You know, nothing I ever say to my students at Columbia impresses them. And, uh, you know, when when I said uh, I'm going to talk to Anthony Fandom, what? <laughs> You're going to talk to Mellon? Oh, my God. It was like, okay. All right. I guess I made it. I made That's when I knew I made it, when I was on your show. That's true. You know, <laughs> like, look. 
We have now made Look, it. Look, um, you take this video as an endorsement, and if you if you need a double endorsement, let me know. I'll come on Zoom with the class, and I'll 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 tr I'll, I'll make it a triple <laughs> endorsement. Oh, that would blow their minds. Okay, very good. Thank you, good sir. All right, Thanks, I'll talk Anthony. to you guys later. Bye. Take care.